Let's stand as we sing together. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let's sing together. service to please join me here now and we'll ask the Lord to bless our time together. <coughs> Father, we thank you for this morning. 
We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your potential that you see in us. We thank you this past week. We thank you for what is yet ahead. And Father, as we pause at this moment, we do so as a family of faith, and we are pausing, and we are inviting your presence and your power and your spirit to speak into our hearts and into our lives. Lord, as we worship, I pray that it would not just be words, but it would be words from our hearts. Father, as we give, may we give as cheerful givers. As we read your word, may there be a hunger and a thirst for your righteousness. And Lord, as your spirit speaks to our hearts, may each one of us say, yes, Lord. And Father, as a result of us being in this place, gathered together in the name of our Savior, that you would prepare us this week to share the good news of how you have changed our lives. You've changed our eternity. And God, I pray that you make us winsome, give us favor, and as a result of our obedience, may many come to faith in Jesus Christ. We thank you for this time, and we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you would, let's stand up. Stand up for Jesus. Let's sing together.
memory verse for this month. Search me, O God. Let's worship the Lord with his tithes and our offerings. Let's worship him. Bible's with you. I'm going to ask you to turn with me to a very familiar passage, the Gospel of John, the third chapter, a verse we probably know by memory. I'll be sharing with you this morning about God's process, so if you'd please stand with me as I'll read to you uh, just one verse, uh, verse number 16. And we stand in honor of God's word. We know that his word is true. And I can testify this morning that God's word has changed my life through Jesus Christ. Uh, verse number 16 says this. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for your goodness and your grace, your mercy, your faithfulness, your patience. And Father, we thank you for your word. And we just read probably the most famous verse of all scripture. God, as we use it as our springboard this morning, I pray that you would grab our attention today. That we would not be distracted, but that your Holy Spirit would reveal to us that which you are doing and desiring to do in us. Father, I pray for myself. I ask that you would cleanse me of my sin. I ask, Lord, that you would think with my mind, 
speak with my mouth because, Father, they are yours. Lord, we thank you in advance for what you're about to do. Open our hearts. Open our minds. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning as we be talking about God's process, I want, as I stand before you today, I want to tell you what I see from my perspective. I see a, a sea of people, and in this sea of people, I see that, uh, I guess you would say there are those that uh, have yet to place their trust in Jesus Christ. There are those who have yet to take that initial step in turning away from their sin and, and, and turning to Jesus in faith. There are yet those yet to do that. And as I stand before you, this sea of people, my desire is that everybody in here would go to heaven. That is my desire. And, uh, you know, in John chapter 3, verse 16, a verse that I, I know that uh, you, you have read before, I'm well satisfied that you have heard of many a sermon about this, but in John chapter 3, verse 16, we see God's answer to our problem. See, all problems come from a three-letter word called sin. And in the middle of that word is the word letter I. And the, as we think about the problem, it's not your sin that's my problem. It's my sin that's my problem. And in the, in the word sin, I, that's where we find there. And we know that the Bible is very clear that for all have sin. And we know that's true. I always ask uh, individuals as they're about to place their faith in Jesus Christ, I ask them, I say, hey, listen, ha have you ever sinned? And usually what, they, what happens is they, they'll say yes and they'll drop their eyes. They know they've sinned. Then I get more specific. I say, well, what have you done? And I promise I won't tell anybody. Then they'll tell me. And then right then they realize there is a problem. Because our sin separates us from God. But in John chapter 3 verse 16, we see God's answer for our sin problem. God came to us when we could not get to him. He sent his son on a rescue mission. And he came to, to seek and to save those who are lost. And here, in just a few moments, what I'm going to do, uh, I'll say a few short moments, I'm going to be inviting those who have yet to make that step to trust Jesus, I'm going to ask you to stand at the end of our service and pledge your allegiance to Jesus Christ and turn away from their sin and turn to Him in faith. That's what's coming shortly. But before I ask those to make that decision... First, let me say a few words about the, those of us who have decided already to follow Jesus. As a follower of Jesus, God the Father is constantly working in us, in our circumstances. You see, God has a, a wonderful plan for our lives. And when you think about God's plan for our lives, those of us who have trusted Jesus, he has began a good work in us. And the scripture says very clearly that he that began a good work in you, he, God, he began that good work in you in Christ Jesus will bring it to pass. He'll fulfill that purpose. He begins something and God will finish it. He's in that process right now as I stand and as we are in his presence. He's in the process of completing his good work in us. So this morning I want to, I guess, maybe uh, show you what that process is. Or maybe you already know God's process, but we all need reminding from time to time of how God completes his good work in us. But God is in the process of making every follower of Jesus a masterpiece. That's what he's in the process of doing. And you see, God's plan for our life is more than just sitting on a, a pew. It's more than just coming to the church for an hour or two a week. It's much more than that. Now, if you were to go to a, a Fayette Mall to a jewelry store, you're going to buy uh, some jewelry. You walk in. And is uh, is uh, the store dark? Is it kind of dirty when you walk in a, a jewelry store? No, no. When you walk into a jewelry store, it's very bright, very aesthetic uh, lighting, and everybody's dressed really neat. Everything's polished and clean. All of those things. 
and uh, they, in that glass case, everything just gleams from that case. However, if you were to track that metal to the original source, it's not the same as it is in the, in the jewelry store. If you were to trace some silver back to its uh, origins, uh, you would see it's not all shiny when it first is found. Uh, a silver mine, if you go there, would be dark, it would be dirty, it would be a, a dangerous place. And I would suggest that probably many a man has lost their life in a dangerous and, and, and a silver mine. But when that ore is brought to the surface... The work is not over, is it? The ore is, is still dirty. It's got some impurities. And that's where the crushing and the smelting is yet to be done. And silver, you know what de degrees it begins to uh, melt? 960.5 degrees Celsius. That's hot. So when that silver comes out in its original form there, it's got these impurities and, and it's got to be heated. It's got to be a, 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 a 960 degrees point five where it gets hot. And uh, that, that's the process that, uh, uh, that God's going to use to uh, get the impurities out of our lives. And this morning as we think about God's process, uh, Solomon was talking about this. The prophet Isaiah talked about this. They had all this in mind as they talked about God's purging process. God has started a good work in us in Christ. And he is now working in that process to bring out more of what he desires inside of us. He is purifying our hearts and our lives. And I want to read to you Proverbs chapter 25, uh, looking at verses, uh, uh, it says this, uh, Remove the dross, the impurities from the silver. As you do that, it says, out comes the material for the silversmith. Now, all of us want our jewelry to be of the highest quality. And uh, we think, all right, it's going to take a process to get the highest quality. Uh, but we don't like that process when we look at the scripture says of how God works in us. You know, it's a difficult topic because we live in a world as Christians that is not our home. And in the world that we live in that's not our home, we are bombarded every day by the world's values and by what the world says is important. And uh, we, 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 we are and bombarded by that, that world view, and we just don't like the thought that God may want to change our lives. <clears throat> that's where we sit most often. We like and we accept and we embrace the thought, God loves me. We, we, we celebrate and we, we enjoy that statement, but, that we, but while we enjoy that statement, we also reject the notion that God may want to rearrange our lives. We like that God loves me, but God would never ask me to change the way I live. God loves me, by the way. So he doesn't want me to change. and I think We reject the idea that God wants to make some changes in our lives. And we, we, we like it when God says things like this, uh, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. We, we celebrate that, yes, uh, God is with me all the time. We also celebrate where he says, I'll bless your coming and your going. We, we, we revel in that statement. We love that. And yes, God did say those things, but God also deals with us like a responsible parent would deal with their child. <coughs> As a parent, sometimes we compliment I'm sure not enough, but we compliment sometimes. We hug and we pat on the back. But however, there are other times that we are to be like what the Apostle Paul told young Timothy. Uh, look at these words, what it says there. It's, he tells Timothy to preach the word, to be prepared in season and out of season, correct and rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Now, we like certain parts of that verse. We like the word it says there uh, with uh, great patience and, and courage. We, we like those, but we, we struggle with the, the, the words there, correcting and rebuking. And in our society today, I'm afraid that many times pastors are viewed as doing a, a good job when they have just a kind word, just telling folks what they want to hear and really and truly watering down the, the statements that Jesus has made. So this morning, I want to share with those who are followers of Jesus how God works in us to bring out his best. And that process that he's working in us is to make us a masterpiece, God's process, 
Number one is by subtraction. Hey, and you think about a refining process, it's found right there. In order to make us that masterpiece that, that he desires us to be, God knows that, that there's going to have to be some subtraction, not some addition. It's absolutely necessity for God to remove the dross from our silver, and he does that by heating us up into an uncomfortable position. That's the way silver is refined, and that's how it speaks about God. And he does that so that he can melt, a, down, melt us down and skim off our slag, and it says, remove our impurities. So the way I see what, what God's Word tells us, that God began a good work in me. He started that day in September 13, 1986. He started that in me that day. And he's in that process even today working in me. And he puts me in situations that, that put me under pressure and heat under my feet. And he's working in me to bring out those impurities so I can be his masterpiece. That's what he is doing. And what he does, he subtracts in order to add. You say, well, that's strange mathematics, uh, but in reality, that's the spiritual realm. In God's math, you sometimes get more by having less. Think about silver. You don't want the impurities in that silver. You want less of the impurities, right? So you can have more. You can have more of what God desires. Now, I have played enough softball to know that sometimes in order to win, you're better off not having a player or two on your team. I've been there before, done that, and it's very possible that uh, one player on the team could be spoiling the rhythm of the rest. They may have better than average ability to hit the ball and maybe feel the ball, but really, truly, their attitude and their influence is bad and it destroys the unity of the team. Now, there's a lot of colleges that have dealt with that, and professional teams, uh, I can think of a few professional players that would quantify in this, and just a cursory search, you can find, I, I, I Google toxic NFL players. Bam, I, I knew about every one of them. I've seen him in the news. Terrell Owens was one. Chad Johnson, another. Then Antonio Brown, more, more, more light, more recently. And uh, they were considered, as one uh, article I read, cancer on the team. And uh, ESPN's analyst Stephen A. Smith mentioned this in regards to Mr. Brown. He said that uh, one fewer player sometimes means a better team. That's what he said. And what I have discovered is true about softball and football I think it's also true of us as individuals, as Christians. Sometimes, God wants to remove things from our lives to make us better. He puts us in that, that pressure and that smelting pot, turns the heat up, and as he does that, he's waiting for those impurities to bubble off the top so he can skim off the slack. And we can be more of that masterpiece of what he desires us to be. See, no matter how large the pile is of, of ore, silver ore, adding more ore to the pile won't make it better. You've got to get the impurities out first. Something has to be removed. Now, I had planned, and I didn't know how to pull this off and have my wife's blessings with this, so I didn't. But I had planned having one of our kitchen bowls and going out and getting some mud in it. And have it sitting up here. Now that's why my wife would have never bought into that. But have it sitting up here. A bowl full of watered down mud. And a bag of cookies. That I want to make. Now you see that picture in my mind. In your mind. And I'm saying alright I'm going to make some cookies in this, in this bowl. So I tear that top off there. And I pour that into there. Well that's got some. Well I'm going to add some more cookies to that. And some more cookies. And I'm going to get rid of all that. No, no. Something's got to be removed first, right? You see what I'm saying? That's the way God deals with us as individuals. Because I want more of this and more of that. Well, that's great and good, but there's some things that first got to go. Some impurities in our personal lives that God knows about, that he's revealed to us, but we're just hanging on to it. Well, I was going to add more good to it, and then maybe that, that'll go away. No, the impurities are still there. They've got to be, it's got to be removed. You know, the impurities being removed, uh, 
So, and the silver has got to be left to remain. And if you leave the impurity of the silver, it's not going to be shiny. And it's not going to be smooth. It's not going to be uh, uh, the masterpiece that the, the jeweler wants it to be. It's just not going to be. Now, we accept this truth in a lot of areas, but we reject it in the spiritual realm. Just imagine this. Say someone goes to their doctor, 80 to 100 pounds overweight, and they tell the doctor these words. Uh, I need you, I, I feel bad every morning that I get up. I want you to give me a pill or something. They've got to pet me up so I can feel better about myself and, and get moving earlier in the morning and all that. And this is what the doctor would say. All the pills in the world aren't going to help you. You need to start, start by losing 50 pounds. I've heard those words before. <laughs> and we reply back facetiously to our doctor. We say, you mean um, I, I can feel better, but I've got to change my whole life? That's not what I want to do. But if the person wants to be happier, they do it by subtracting. You see the process? Also, a patient has a cancerous growth and uh, who comes in wanting something more than Tylenol to dull the pain. The doctor would say, well, that's not going to work. That growth's got to be cut out. Now, look, doctor, I, I came to you uh, not wanting to lose part of my body. I, I just want to feel better and all that. Well, in order to feel better, you've got to lose this particular part of your body. It's called cancer. It has to go. You mean, you're my friend. And you want to cut part of my body and take it away? Absolutely. Many of us are quick to say amen in church. We might uh, raise our hands in worship and we grasp biblical truth. That's all great and good and we should. But we can easily also try to avoid the fact that all the noise, all the knowledge, and all the world will get us nowhere if we have unremoved dross. Impurities in our lives. Some of us may be overextended financially. Some of us may uh, have a calendar that's just way too busy. And the only way to get healthy uh, for, away from our indebtedness is to cut back the busyness. And here's what I want to say. Maybe you'll take home this, this with you. That whatever clutters our walk with God becomes God's target. For his purging process. So whatever it is in your life that is in competition with the Lord. That's God's target. He wants to remove the impurities. Those things that are hindering us in his flow of grace in our lives. He wants to remove those things so that we can become that masterpiece. That he wants us to be. Now, if we're a follower of Christ, uh, uh, because God loves us, he will be very direct with us. He, he always tells us the truth, and he is absolutely ruthless about going after those things in our lives that stop the flow of his grace and his blessing in our lives. His process, God's process, is to subtract in order to add, and God will never, never, never make a, a little treaty with your secret sin. What God says is, that has to go. If you're going to have the flow of my blessings and my grace in your life, if you're going to make a great difference in this world for my kingdom, that sin has to go. I think that when Jesus, when he started his public ministry, one of the first stops, according to the Gospel of John, was the cluttered temple. We know that story. Now, when he went to the temple, did he bring, uh, did he bring in some new paint colors and some expensive furniture to kind of give a, a better decor? No, that's not what he did. He got rid of those things that did not belong. In fact, one time he fashioned a whip and ran those wrong things out, those, those profiteers that, there in the temple. He, he showed himself as a tough refiner that day because he deeply loved the purpose of the temple as a house of prayer to all nations, and he wanted it, it to be restored. See, so we've got to face the fact that in order to be what God wants us to be, he'll have to take things out of our lives that don't belong. So let's ask ourselves a few questions. Are there attitudes in me that grieve the Lord? If there are, that's a target. 
that God's wanting to remove? Are there habits in my life that need to be broken? If that is true, that's his target of his purging process. Where are the impurities in my life? A ask the Lord, Lord, search my heart and know my heart, O oh God. See if there's any offensive way in me, as our memory verse says. Know my anxious thoughts, test me, it says. And lead me in the way, in the way everlasting. Lord, Lord is there, a, is there a, any impurities in my life that I know need to go? And if there are impurities, they need to go. Is there a desire to be seen? Or to uh, be acknowledged? Or to receive praise? And what we must do is we must be absolutely open and inviting to God and let Him thoroughly search us. Lord, look inside of me. I'm not going to look at anybody else. Look inside of me. If there's anything in me that doesn't belong, Lord, I agree with you. Search me, our scripture says. See if there's any offensive way in these. So the second thing I want to notice is this, is that usually God's process is difficult. In Malachi chapter number 3, it says these words to us. It says, he will be like a refiner's fire. He, God. He, God, will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He, God, will purify and refine. It's pretty clear what God says that he will do. Now, does our theology include God sitting there uh, on the smelting pot looking at waiting for those impurities to, to bubble up to the top? So we take that flat ladle and take that slag off the top so that it can be more pure. That's what scripture teaches us. It, it's right there. And what he does is to get our pot of metal, our lives hotter, he turns the heat up. Turns that heat up. It's very uncomfortable. But he wants to skim off those impurities that have bubbled to the surface. Is it comfortable? No. Is it uh, pleasant? No. But it's our Savior's method of getting rid of our junk. And as he does so, his joy and his peace will be filled immediately deeper than before. Now, if you're a parent, you might know what it means to see too much junk food going into your child's mouth. And when you take action, it doesn't make you exactly popular about things. But you do what you do because you, you love your child. You're not trying to rain on the parade. No, not whatsoever. But you do these things because they, you love them. Listen to how God, what God says. He says, the Lord disciplines those he loves. As a father, the son he delights in. See, God's purpose, really, for us is a lot deeper than just how we feel at the moment. He lovingly permits pressures and trials to come our ways and let the bottom fall out in our lives so that the wrong reactions uh, that will come up to the surface, that where we lack faith, we were, where we lack love, that God intentionally places those things in our lives, those situations, then we're be, they're beyond our ability to cope. He permits those difficulties to come and we say, why God? Well, what he's doing is refining us. He is teaching us to trust him. He, he's drawing us away from our own strength into his strength. He knows exactly how much heat to allow in our lives. He won't scorch us. But if we jump out of the fire, we jump right into another pot. He's always waiting to get rid of those impurities in our lives. The dross has got to be removed. Now, let's just kind of just bring it all together. Uh, the, the process is to remove the iniquities and to purge the dross from our lives. And you know what, how an ancient refiner, they've got that silver and that smelting pot there. They're heating up there. And as those impurities come up the top, he takes that, that, uh, that little ladle and takes that impurity off the top. You know how they say that the ancient refiner knew he was done? As he keep pouring the heat, that ore, that silver, keep pouring the heat to it, take the slag off, take the impurities out, keep pouring the heat to it. But it is said that he would stop the fire when he could see his reflection in the ore. Wow, you could preach a day and a half there, couldn't you? God allows. 
allows those things in our lives to put us under pressure, under heat. Let those impurities come out on the top. He can take care of those on the top there. He's not going to finish till he looks down and says, Oh, I see in Carl, I see my son Jesus. Oh, I see in Jimmy, my son Jesus. Keep pouring that heat. Let those impurities come up. Take that slag off the top, those impurities. And keep it up. Oh, I can see my dear son. Right there in a reflection. What does the scripture say? It tells us that he wants us to be conformed into the image and the likeness of his son. He wants to see his son's reflection in us. That's what he wants. And I believe that Jesus today is in the still refining business. He is still purifying. And as he works in our lives, he, he keeps looking for his blessed reflection. It's God's way of sanctifying us. And it's his way of getting the impurities that rob us of God's best. We ought to face the fact that God will not let us remain the way we are today. <clears throat> He's in the process of completing what he started. In our hearts and in our lives. And I love this. I'm sure you've seen this. I may be a Christian, but I'm still under construction. And no one in this room is finished yet. He's the refiner. He's still working in us. And he's going to keep on working in us until he sees his son's reflection in the way that we talk, in the way that we think, in the way that we act. And he's going to keep doing that until he brings, makes us that masterpiece that he wants us to be. So we only really and truly, as individuals, we really and truly move ahead by losing some things, those impurities. What's the greatest need we have with God? Greatest need. I've got the answer. I would suggest communion with him. The greatest need. But with there are hindrances, things that hinder our walk with him. We have weights that uh, slow us down as we try to run that race of faith. Our hearts get clogged up with uh, unedifying habits and unnecessary things. And then we, we've all seen this before, that we, we've seen someone who begins to fight that, that purifying process of God, and things really get ugly. We've seen it happen before. And I have to admit that I've been on that receiving end. When the dross and the impurities of our lives are grasped hold of like they're a treasure, it's going to hurt. We know, folks. I, was, I thought about telling you story after story in my years of ministry of those I've seen who have shipwrecked in their faith. But I about guarantee it, you know some yourself. They fought that purging process. They, they fought what God was wanting to do to make them that masterpiece, and they shipwrecked. <clears throat> Self-destructed. And this is what I think, I believe with all my heart, that God is dealing with each one of us as individuals today. We've been warned by His Holy Spirit. We've laid awake at night, not sleeping, because of the conviction of sin. Holy Spirit's warning us that shipwreck is imminent unless we agree with what God has said. I've always had a, always liked watching documentaries about the Titanic. You know, I, I just like watching those. I'm sure you, we've all seen the movie, different movies about the Titanic, different documentaries about it. But when it sank in the, the cold waters of the North Atlantic, 1,500 lives were tragically taken, over 1,500 lives. But as tragic as that was and is, it's child's play compared to the spiritual tragedy of men and women who reject God's process of making them his masterpiece. If we reject God's process, 
will wake up in dark, cold, lonely places. But God has so much more for us than that. So he began a good work. He's wanting to bring it to pass. And that work is bringing out those impurities, that dross in our lives. And he's going to keep working as we keep cooperating with him. And I, I love this phrase. Ask yourself this question. Am I aggressively cooperating with God? Am I letting God have his way? He's constantly working until he sees the reflection of his son in us. Let's pray together. Ask the Lord to help us, those of us who are followers of Christ. <clears throat> Let's pray together. God, I ask you today that you would cleanse us and purify our lives. Melt the dross and remove the impurities, all of it. Whether it's in word or in deed or thought. God, I pray you would save us from ourselves and establish us in your righteousness with your strong right hand. Lord, we ask this in the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus. We ask humbly, depending upon you. God, may you see your image of your Son in us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, just as I promised, maybe you're here this morning and you would say, I have yet to trust Jesus as my Savior. God loves you. He has a plan for your life. He paid the penalty for your sins by offering a, his son and to give you a free gift. And I would suggest that he's calling you this morning. He's wanting you, you to experience his very best. And I want to invite you to turn away from your sin and run to Jesus. Step out of your pew where you have to come take me by the hand and let me pray with you. And let God have his way in your life. And today you can be born again. You can be forgiven. So as we stand, it's an invitation for all to agree with what God says and to aggressively cooperate with him. Let's stand together. <laughs>